Um, and um, yeah, so today Molly and I will be presenting um, and I'll start off and then I'll pass it on to Molly. So uh, Molly, uh, great benefit um, that we had to have her um, interested in frailty and reach out to us at IRDT um, and able to get her on to some of the ongoing frailty research that we have, um, uh, that we're doing um, using the administrative data that we have available at MBIRDT. Um, and so Molly, not being exposed to administrative data before, um, got to have her first experience exposure um, and um, lovely enough um, concluded her fellowship with the publication which will be coming out uh, this year um, describing frailty in New Brunswick which she'll give you a little bit of insights into as well. Um, so just getting into a bit of about the background of our work, um, really the focus of uh, this research um, that I'm going to be describing to you today um, and building on uh, over the, the next number of years, I hope, um, with additional funding um, uh, from grant opportunities that we have available and currently um, actively seeking. Um, but really, I think the question um, is framed as um, we have we know that aging is inevitable, but is aging frail? Um, and this is an important question uh, in particular for our aging population. Um, as, uh, as we know, uh, the Canadian population continues to grow um, in, in terms of the older population um, and uh, supporting and being able to support uh, this population uh, to age in place in the community is really a priority uh, for this population, but also for us as, as, as um, service providers um, and helping um, aiming to help support this, this population. For uh, the purposes of this research, I'm particularly interested in this dual. Um, so the, the idea of helping to support um, couples um, as they age in place in the community. Um, so when we think about um, aging um, and aging frailly, uh, the idea of compressing um, that period of fr fragility or frailty to end of life is really important um, in that we can we can we've done a really great job um, in helping people to live longer um, but we really want those last uh, years of life to be good life um, and to be good years um, and not to 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 be um, in this state of fragility um, and when we think about um, uh, older couples, uh, maintaining that independence and, 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 and connectedness um, with one another is really important for both their uh, physical and, and mental quality of life. And so trying to inform on this uh, population um, is something that we're interested in doing. It's a bit of, of an emerging area of research. There are um, you know, definitely publications focusing on caregiving and impacts of that, but understanding the relationships between couples and how they age and how impacts of frailty um, and things that may lead to higher risks of frailties or things that uh, are a, a factor uh, as a result of frailty um, is something that's really uh, starting to be looked at. Um, just recently, actually, um, we um, identified a publication that was just published um, and uh, looking at uh, couples in the age and and and. Um, this research demonstrates that looking over time, uh, we see that um, a, a couple's um, or a partner status at one time point um, a really large impact outcomes, um, not frailty, but things like cognitive decline, um, other things that are really important to improving um, and maintaining quality of life in this population. And so our interest is really to try to start to help inform on this question and use some of the data here in New Brunswick to try to reduce the impacts of frailty and maintain this connectedness between um, our community dwelling older couples to help support them to age in place. So I mentioned why we're interested in this and who uh, we're specifically interested in, but really, what is this concept of frailty? Uh, it sounds familiar, um, but what do we mean when we say frailty? And when I um, say that, I say that with caution um, because it is a bit of a, an abstract concept. So there's different models that are used to describe it. And I'll show you a few of them to just try to give you a sense as to what that is. All right, just to first start off, um, the World Health Dirt definition of frailty, if I can move this thing, um, is, is uh, detailed here. Um, so really what is, is, is the definition that they've, uh, they've used is that frailty is a clinically recogni recognizable state in which the ability of older people to cope with everyday or acute stressors is compromised by an increased vulnerability brought on by age-associated declines in physical 
physiological reserve and function across multiple organ systems. So a bit of a mouthful, but there's key words in there that are important for us to, to highlight um, that really bring on that peace um, and clear, uh, clarity related to frailty. It's really important um, to highlight that frailty uh, is, is structured around the impact of stressors and that vulnerability. Having a stressor in your life is not positive, but your ability to cope with that stressor and uh, uh, make your way out of that stressor um, is uh, not compromised because you have that reserve and that ability um, to overcome that stressor. As we age, minor stressors, even though they may not have a large impact on us previously, those stressors may have a large impacts because of the state of vulnerability of the individual. They don't have that reserve. They don't have that function across their physiological systems to be able to adapt or cope with that stressor. And so this places this group of individuals in a very compromised state in that a simple thing like a urinary tract infection, for example, which we are able to clear um, quite easily uh, with proper medication is just not possible for that population. And that would lead to possible other um, outcomes that would further um, deteriorate their function or quality of life. So this is one model of frailty. Um, so uh, if we have the dotted line across the middle, above that dotted line is an individual, uh, if you can imagine them, independent. And below the dotted line is an individual who is dependent. So thinking about dependency related to social factors, but also, or social um, activities, but also physical activities. Um, and so the line at which um, that uh, demarks independence from dependence it is really an important uh, concept for uh, describing frailty. So these trajectories here, there's a green trajectory and a red trajectory, and they, if you can imagine two individuals having the same stressor. So the minor illness of a urinary tract infection is that stressor. Of course, having a urinary tract infection causes ill health. And so that's demonstrated by that decline. But with proper treatment, we can regain that function. As you can see here, the red uh, trajectory is intended to characterize someone who has a higher level of frailty than the green trajectory. And with that same uh, stressor, the uh, impact on the frail individual is substantially greater, as you see by the height of the bar, but also that stressor takes that individual from a state of being independent or relatively independent to being dependent. As well as the rebound of, of that stressor, you can see it's not at the same line. So that's a continuous decline in function as a result of continuous stressors. The, the, the trajectory as it tears out, you can see it's very close to that line and you can imagine an additional stressor further brings that individual down and maybe they don't come back over that line and that's where that dependence remains. So a big, big especially in New Brunswick, I guess now we don't have the rain, we're not the rain, Canadian rain champions for oldest or fastest growing oldest population by I think a point or something. Um, but nonetheless, the aging population is nothing to shy away from. I think there's some estimates that I think it was in 2004, they estimated about 460 million people over the age of 65. And they anticipate or estimate that that number by the 2050 will be over 2 billion. It's a substantial increase in the number of individuals over the age of 65. Granted, frailty does not impact individuals um, as often in younger ages, um, those who are, you know, the tend to impact individuals as they age um, into higher um, age brackets. Um, but this is also really important um, because this is when you need to be able to support these individuals in greater respects. Um, and with a large number of individuals uh, needing these resources, we're going to have to be strategic in how uh, we approach um, this problem and trying to maintain function um, in our aging population. 
So the role of yourselves uh, being within the Department of Health is really to develop programs and policies that can really help to focus on preventing this decline in this intrinsic capacity and maintenance of this physical functional ability. This figure, I really like it. It's from the aging framework from the WHO. Um, and so it provides um, a nice schematic of, of what I'm explaining in terms of frailty. So when we think of frailty, we've got this blue line that's really uh, the outwardly vision of um, view of the individual as their functional ability. But intrinsic to us is our systems and that all working together to help us rebound from particular stressors. But that intrinsic ability to bounce back or being resilient to minor stressors continues to be compromised as we age or it's more likely to be compromised as we age. And so this um, further compounds the impacts on physical function as well. And there's different levels that they propose for interventions and, and, and programs to impact at the health services level, at the long-term care level, as well as the environmental level, thinking about age-friendly communities, promoting capacity and removing barriers so that you know, aging individuals can be um, uh, in, uh, uh, functional in their, in their environments. And I did mention one thing, that intrinsic capacity decreases with age, but the rate of that decline is not necessarily age associated. There are a population of aging uh, individuals who die non-frail. So that individual intrinsic decline is really an important point of this picture to try to in, ensure that we can maintain that capacity, but also the outward uh, physical functioning that we are more likely to be able to see or measure. On to measuring frailty. So it's a complicated thing to describe um, and to conceptualize. It's even more difficult to measure. There's decades and decades of research on measuring frailty. Um, it's a latent construct. It has unclear operation, 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 operationalization, geez, um, uh, and which makes it really difficult to get a, a clear definition in which an approach in which to, to characterize this. Um, there's no consensus on how to do it, but two kinds of approaches have emerged, one the phenotypic approach and the cumulative deficits approach, and I'll explain those um, uh, to you a bit. I'm new-ish to the frailty world, um, so just being um, in on seeing all the different approaches, um, the important part is that they're capturing different aspects of frailty, uh, but there's no one you know, ultimate gold standard type of measure um, that we can rely on. Maybe one day we'll have one. So like I said, there's sort of two models of measuring frailty. The phenotypic model, uh, which is called the Freed model. Freed is a, is a, is a, is a person who developed this model. Um, and it's based on sort of changes in function related to these five areas, uh, related to weight loss. Did the individual lose a certain amount of weight, um, a percentage of their weight, unexpectedly, for example? Are they reporting um, exhaustion? Do they have low energy expenditure? Has their gait slowed? Do they have weak grip strength. Monitoring these objective measures allows you to track and how frailty is changing. And together, the collection of information has been demonstrated to do a pretty good job of identifying um, a, an individual at high risk of frailty. Of course, that requires a physical uh, assessment of an individual, uh, which can be very resource intensive and from a research perspective, sometimes is not possible. Um, and so cumulative deficit is an alternative approach that's been developed. Um, Sorali is, is one of the key um, uh, uh, researchers who's is leading um, that um, uh, methodology. Um, but really, it's, it's the idea of identifying a collection of of, um, of conditions um, or uh, diseases that an individual might have um, that would lead to a higher risk of frailty. So um, just because you have a specific condition doesn't mean you're frail. For example, um, in cumulative deficit um, approaches dementia is a very um, common uh, condition that's included, but just because you have dementia doesn't mean you're frail. Um, and so those two things, while um, associated are not one in hand in hand. So there are some limitations of using a number of conditions that you have to characterize your frailty um, because there's other factors um, that go into play. But these are kind of ways that we've uh, approached um, this problem.
So I'm going to pass it on to Molly, and so she can give you a bit of insights on how we actually do this in, in administrative data. Yes, um, thanks, Sandra. So yeah, so I guess when thinking of wanting to estimate or characterize frailty at a population level, we're limited to using the cumulative deficit approach. So the ways that we've done that here in Canada is by using the hospital frailty risk score as well as the chi high hospital frailty risk measure. And the way that that's been done is um, looking at the ICD code. So that's routinely um, collected medical records and using that um, and the logarithm that's able to estimate the Frail, um, the risk of frailty. And it does that over a two year period and it um, categorizes patients as no frailty risk, low frailty risk, intermediate and high frailty risk scores. Um, so yeah, next slide. So the work that we've done, um, so we've used the hospital frailty risk score and applied it in the New Brunswick context. So using the way that I just mentioned, using those ICD codes to come up with this um, tool. And what we found was um, between April 1st, 2017 and March 31st, 2019, that 55,675 older adults over the age of 65 were hospitalized, um, and of which 52% were females. And we found that for all those who were hospitalized, 21% were characterized as frail. And the way that we define um, frailty um, for this project or the study was if they had a high or intermediate frailty risk score. Um, and frailty risk score, I didn't mention this earlier, but it is um, out of 15, so zero to 15. So they're given um, that score according to that logarithm. And we are going to, as the last bullet point says, um, publishing that in the Canadian Geri Geriatrics Journal um, later this year. Um, next slide. So some of our findings from um, the work that we did um, is demonstrated in this um, figure right here. So on the y-axis, this shows the prevalence of frailty. Um, on the X, you can see the different age groups. So 65 to 74, 75 to 84, and then 85 and above. Um, in red, um, that's the, those are females, and in blue are males. So as you can see, um, so this is the percentage, like I said, of frailty risk. So those categorized as intermediate or high frailty risk. So um, for the younger age groups, so 65 to 74, we found that for males and females, um, the risk of frailty was pretty quite similar. But as age increased, um, females were more likely to be um, frail than their males um, at the, in those same age groups, um, which we found interesting. Um, and then, yep, next slide, that's good. <laughs> and then this next figure is these two figures um, show um, a similar story, just a little bit more granular. So um, instead of just dividing it up or categorizing um, the patients as frail or non-frail or according to the risk, you can see that this is more granular to their actual score. So zero to 15, um, all the way down that y-axis. And again, the age groups um, across the X. And you can see that there's a little bit of a difference in the distribution of frailty um, between males and females. Although it's not large, you can see some small differences, especially again, kind of what we saw in that first figure um, that for the older age groups that females, we can see that darker shading um, for the higher frailty uh, score. So 15 being more frail. Um, so you can see that those clusters are a little bit different between the males and females. And I think that was my last slide to chat about. So I think I'm handing it back to Sandra now. <laughs> Thanks so much, Molly. Um, so uh, yeah, so the objective of uh, our work um, that's focused on community dwelling older couples was to build off the work that Molly had um, had done when uh, she was a fellow at IRDT um, and to use that um, data to be able to characterize um, uh, couples uh, within, um, within those um, hospitalized seniors um, and focusing in on those who are still remaining um, in the community. So um, these are older couples who uh, live um, at home. Um, they're not in a long-term care facility or an adult residential facility. Um, and, um, and these were identified um, through our data. And so our goal was to examine how does the relationship between couples um, uh, look in terms of their frailty status? If your husband or your wife is more likely to be frail, are you also more likely to be frail? So this is our first look um, into this data. 
Um, so what we did is we had a cross-sectional study um, and we had identified first um, uh, couples um, in New Brunswick living in the communities who were over the age of 65. Um, so both of the both of the partners, both spouses have to be over the age of 65. Um, so uh, we identified 37,000 um, couples um, amongst uh, that population. Uh, so we used um, data at IRDT to identify these individuals. Um, we use the Citizen Medicare Registry, which is a, a health care re card registry in New Brunswick, and the Discharge Abstract Database, which is the hospital claims uh, records in New Brunswick. So anybody so admitted to hospital uh, receives a record there. And uh, we searched the same period that Molly had described. Um, so we identified married couples living in the community uh, using the Medicare Registry Database, um, information on household structure, as well as marital status. Um, then we use the Hospital Frailty Risk Score um, that that's uh, an algorithm that Molly had described that takes the diagnosis codes from um, the hospital-based data. And then we uh, used both the continuous score, so the score of zero to 15 that Mo Molly showed you, as well as that categorization uh, of the four risk groups. Um, and we use regression modeling just to look at how frailty compares between spouses, adjusting for the age of, of both spouses, since we know that age is, is an important factor in, in, in frailty. All right, so just getting into uh, the results. Sorry about that. Um, so this just gives you a, a, a sense of the age um, at which um, each of the groups according to their frailty risk. Um, so individuals who are not hospitalized are um, furthest to your left. Um, and um, those individuals um, are in terms of age um, ranges and, and averages similar to individuals who were hospitalized but didn't have any of the conditions in the frailty score. Um, and so um, if it individuals are hospitalized for other reasons that don't um, uh, include conditions that may be related to frailty, um, they receive a score of zero. Um, of course, the hospitalized individuals, we, we don't have any score for them because we don't know what conditions they have. So um, we assume, and um, rightfully or not, at this point that those who are not hospitalized have lowest risk of frailty, but this is something that we're aiming to look into as well. Um, as frailty risk increases from low, intermediate to high, we see that the average age also increases. Um, we see um, overall that in couples at least, um, so this is the population of couples, um, that the, the partner male partner is on average older um, in um, a, a lower frailty group um, than their female um, uh, counterpart. So I don't know if you can see my cursor. As you can see here, these are the males in the low frailty group, and they have the same average age as the females um, in the intermediate <coughs> frailty group. So this is just um, uh, further highlighting that females um, uh, appear to be at a higher level of frailty at a younger age. Um, when we look at the number of hospitalizations, because um, you can imagine if someone's hospitalized many times, there's a lot of opportunities uh, to be able to identify conditions which uh, increase the risk of frailty. Um, and so as expected, those individuals with a higher frailty have a higher number of hospitalizations. Um, so um, in fact, it makes sense that we're identifying higher levels of frailty because uh, hospitalization is associated with frailty, um, but we're also interested in sort of teasing out some of the impacts that um, the contribution of, of hospitalizations um, have um, with respect to uh, higher rates of frailty um, as well. All right, so this is kind of giving you a bit of a schematic of how, oops, how, give me one second. Apologize, my cat just came in and my dog might follow in there and will be chaos. Um, so this just gives you a bit of a scatter plot of what, um, how the couples compare um, to one another. Um, so at the top, we have the male uh, couple score and along um, the side, we have the female couple score. Uh, red indicates higher number of individuals, um, whereas the dark blue indicates the lowest number of individuals. So great that we identified that uh, among couples, uh, community over couples over the age of 65, the most predominant individuals have no frailty score. Um, and so we did identify that a majority of, of couples were not hospitalized. And so that's represented in that, in that box um, there. Um, we can see that as frailty 
increases, um, we have a, a less number of individuals, and this is because frailty is very closely associated with mortality. Um, so when you have a high frailty score, the, the next st stage is likely death. Um, and so um, the fact that we have a low number of those individuals is good, but the fact that there's a, a proportion of individuals that have uh, both spouses at this really extremely high frailty risk, living in the community is really important and trying to understand what those dynamics might be. Um, it might help to inform where interventions might help to support this, uh, this couple or this pair. So we identified um, at a cross-sectional level, so your frailty today and how that relates to your partner's frailty today, uh, we did identify a, an association which suggested that there was a slight increase um, related um, to your part, uh, a slight increase in your frailty as related to your partner's frailty. When we also um, took a look at the, the data as opposed to using the actual score the individual had, we looked at the categorization of frailty. Um, and so here we identified um, um, that, uh, like I had mentioned, a pro large proportion of couples are not hospitalized. Um, and so we can see that 73% uh, of uh, the not hospitalized uh, males also had a, a spouse who was not hospitalized. As we uh, move uh, higher in the frailty risk, um, there's less a chance that the spouse um, is not been hospitalized and more chance that the spouse is hospitalized as well as more chance the spouse is hospitalized and we're identifying them as having a high frailty risk as well. Um, when we identified um, uh, looking at this using a, a model, uh, we estimated that, um, again, at a cross-sectional level, um, today, if you are classified as having an intermediate or high frailty risk, um, that your partner um, has a 23% increased chance of also being classified at that frailty risk. And this is um, limited in the sense that we know that um, these impacts likely happen over time. Um, and so this is just really looking at uh, the same time period um, in these couples, um, but it's really trying to uh, starting to highlight that there there is a concordance uh, between frailty um, in community dwelling older couples who remain living in their homes, and that there's an important uh, piece of the puzzle that we need to dig deeper in to try to understand um, how these relationships um, coincide, as well as what impacts they might have um, for uh, keeping um, our seniors in the community and reducing admissions into long term care, for example, which would then uh, break up this couple. So just in conclusion, uh, we found that the majority of couples over the age of 65 were not hospitalized over our study period. Male partners were older and had more hospitalizations than females in every age category. Um, um, uh, frailty risk categories were more informative for our analyses than using our continuous score. And we identified um, a concordance at, at the cross-sectional level between couples. So our next steps, we currently are working, uh, uh, we have a summer student who's working with us. Uh, we received funding from UNB and, and NBHRF uh, to develop a frailty index using uh, NBIRDT data, which is GNB data. Um, so the idea is to expand beyond the hospital frailty um, and to be able to characterize frailty uh, across um, all seniors in New Brunswick um, so that we're not limited to only focusing on those hospitalized um, individuals given the tools that we have available. Uh, so at our IRDT, we have data from different departments, including health, but also social development and different services that cover seniors. And so we may be able to do a better job of characterizing frailty in those who have not been hospitalized. Um, our next step is also to look longitudinally. So we have set up a 15 year study design to look at how frailty evolves um, as seniors age um, through that trajectory. We're interested in characterizing the burden at the system as well as the individual as well as understanding impacts of program and services really aimed at delaying that frailty progression and, and aiming to see how that that might play into our um, into our uh, into our results um, in terms of delaying um, certain outcomes such as uh, long-term care um, uh, 
extramural program, as well as other programs that are intended to support seniors remaining in the community, um, as well as we're, we're aiming to look at the relationships between frailty and admission to nursing homes uh, once we have um, nursing home data from social development. So some potential impacts, we really frame this pro project to uh, aim at several audiences, including policymakers and decision makers like yourselves, health system and administrators, as well as academics. Our goal is to improve understanding of frailty and community with dwelling older couples in order in New Brunswick in order to help support uh, our priorities of aging in place. And we really hope that our research will help uh, resources be allocated appropriately to really prevent that decline in that intrinsic capacity and encourage maintenance of functional ability. So I guess I've said a lot, so I thank you guys for listening and I welcome any comments, questions, and I have a few questions here um, for you guys, um, as I would love to know more from uh, your perspective of your own work. If you don't have a question yourself to ask me, if you feel um, inclined to answer these, it would be really helpful for us to learn from you, um, like what would a better understanding of frailty in New Brunswick help your work and in what way? And are there certain programs or services that you're aware of that are intended to support this population that maybe we could take advantage of and want to take say take advantage of obtain data in which to explore how that might impact um, these trajectories in, in this population. So thank you so much.